Hello everyone. Today we're going to study market power, or at least the introduction to market power. This is an extension of our previous study of market failure, because in market power we are going to look at how different market structures arise when there is imperfect competition in the market. This is a heroic story in five parts. Our, our epic five-part story, if I'm really going to dive into this superhero theme, starts today with the introduction. Then we'll get into perfect, the four different market structures, which are going to be perfectly competitive, uh, monopolies, oligopolies, and monopolistic competition. As I stated in the beginning, this is a topic that flows naturally from market failure. Whenever markets are not perfectly competitive and that imperfect competition exists, we then have markets that are not allocatively or productively efficient, which if we had a graph here of producer surplus and consumer surplus or any other graph that we're going to be looking at, we would definitely be demonstrating on those graphs where the welfare loss would arise. If we're sticking with the superhero theme, our welfare loss, since it's WL, I found this little owl graphic. <laughs> I will try to drop the owl in wherever we have welfare loss. Uh, we're going to have welfare loss throughout these graphs because of that a situation of imperfect competition. The introduction will cover the math behind how we come up with these market structures. The math and how we do the math is the same, though once we get to the different market structures, the math will yield different shapes of some of these curves. So we'll go over the math and I'll give you an opportunity to practice. And we'll give you some general background, especially about profits as we go through. First, let's take a look at the general market structures before we even get into any of the math. There are those four big market structures that we're going to talk about are perfectly competitive, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, and monopolies. Those four big market structures can be classified by four categories, the number of firms in an industry, the level of product differentiation or the, or the availability of substitutes, the freedom or the barriers to entry and exit to that market, and the level of market power, which we'll talk about a little bit as concentration ratio as the way you can measure that. Uh, those four classifications can be applied to all the four different types of market structures. If you want to see it linearly, if we go from least competitive to most competitive, there they are linear, linearly at the bottom of your screen. If we take those four market structures and add in now those four categories and ways we can classify the market structures, we can put together a chart that just very simply overviews the four market structures before we get into a whole lot of detail. To understand the categories, let me walk you through the perfectly competitive marketplace, and then I would encourage you to copy down this entire chart so that you have a general idea of where we're headed with market structures. In a perfectly competitive market, there's a nearly infinite number of firms. Uh, now, in the real world, it's not infinite, but nearly infinite. Uh, there is no, nothing that keeps somebody from opening up or starting a firm that is per in a perfectly competitive marketplace, and there's nothing that keeps anybody from leaving that marketplace, which is why when we jump two columns over, we say it's completely free for an individual or a firm to en enter or exit this marketplace. The type of product that is made in a perfectly competitive marketplace is no different or is virtually not at all different compared to another product in the marketplace. Uh, if you think about going to the grocery store or the local market and seeing pumpkins, um, the, way one, uh, the way one farmer grows pumpkins versus another, uh, the end result is a pumpkin that doesn't look all that different. If we look at the level of market power, this is how much power one firm in that industry or one firm in that market holds over all the other firms. In a perfectly competitive market, one firm holds virtually no power over any other firm. Now, if we go from the most uh, or the most competitive form of market structure to the least competitive, again, you could follow down what each of these categories looks like, but just look at market or market power. We go from no market power of the individual firm for perfectly competitive to a significant or extreme or absolute amount of market power for monopolies. So again, I would go ahead and copy down this chart. And please know that we will get into a lot of specific detail about what these different market structures are. It is prudent at this point just to have a general overview. But since we're going to dive into some detail, we need to understand the math behind diving into some of that detail. The detail and the numbers that we're going to get into all revolve around the idea that firms want to make a profit. Now, a slide like this will appear at the end because firms aren't only exclusively interested in profit, but most firms, that is their number one goal. Firms can make profits by increasing their revenues and decreasing the amount of costs. And we can talk about economic profit being the, the difference between total revenue and total costs, which we will see again toward the end of this, this presentation. But all the variables that go into calculating that are the same regardless of market structure. Uh, again, we'd end up with different looking graphs, but how we do the math is the focus of this presentation and how we do the math is similar between all the different market structures. 
So the first bit of math that we're going to look at is called total cost, uh, which a common abbreviation for is TC. Total cost is made up of both fixed cost and variable cost. And I don't believe you're ever going to have to calculate fixed cost and variable cost, but it's important to know the difference. Fixed costs are the items that a firm needs to cover that do not change as production increases. So your rent isn't going to change as your production increases. Your phone bills, your loan marine payments, all of those things aren't going to change over time as your production increases. They're fixed. And honestly, if you make zero products, you're still paying those fixed costs, which is an interesting way of knowing what your fixed costs are. Your variable costs are the things that will change as you make more and more production. You're certainly going to need more raw materials. You actually might need an additional factory or an additional workspace. You're going to need more labor. So the total costs, which you'll probably never have to calculate, would be the fixed cost plus the variable cost for your firm. After we are done our lecture today, you're going to practice what this looks like, and you're going to have a chart that you fill out where you have the output quantity and the price, and the first thing that's going to be given to you is total costs. Now, if you look at this particular chart, at the quantity level of zero, there's still a cost of $5 for producing a 10 ounce bag of coffee. At a cost of $5 with zero output, that tells us that the fixed cost for producing this bag of coffee is $5. The variable cost then would be anything beyond $5 for, that, for each level of output moving forward. So even though you might not be asked to calculate it, or it might not be a line item in your chart, you could still calculate what the fixed costs are. A shout out to a local Philadelphia coffee maker, Reanimator Coffee. Uh, one of my colleagues in my school really loves this coffee and it presents a nice example or a close example of what very competitive, not necessarily perfectly competitive, but a very competitive market would be. Average cost. If we look at average cost, it's the per unit cost of production. The average cost curve will generally be a U-shaped curve on your graph. Um, average costs are the, just the total cost divided by the quantity or the output in your graph. And we'll see very easily what that's going to look like. The average cost curve, the, the lowest point on that curve, represents productive efficiency. Uh, productive efficiency is something that you'll, re you'll remember when we talked about the efficiency in marketplaces with perfectly competitive markets. The average cost curve is going to be the total cost curve divided by that quantity output. So if we look at the math, the average cost is going to be the total cost divided by the quantity output. So for this first line, that's going to be zero. But in the second line, we have the total cost divided by the output of one, and we get 18 as our average cost. Now, certainly as we go down, if we had uh, outputs of two, three, four, or five, we would see the average cost change over time. Remember, whenever you hear the word marginal, we're talking about the additional, uh, the additional cost or the additional something as we increase production of a good. Marginal cost would be the additional cost or the cost for the firm to produce one extra unit of a good. The marginal cost will change over time. So at initially, the marginal cost will decrease. And if you remember your study from microeconomics, the law of diminishing marginal returns would tell us why marginal cost would decrease over time. After a couple units of output, the marginal, cost, the marginal cost curve will start to increase, and we'll see marginal costs go right back up. To calculate marginal costs, we have the total cost of a level of output minus the total cost of the previous level of output. So if we are looking at the output level of two, Marginal cost would be the total cost of uh, the output level of two minus the total cost of the previous level of output, which would be one. So if we look over at our example, there is no marginal cost at the output level of zero, but at, at the output level of one, it's the total cost of this level of output minus the total cost of the previous level of output, which gives us our marginal cost. And again, you could calculate that down through a, a set of data, knowing that it's always the total cost of our current output level minus the total cost of the previous output level. Total revenue is going to, going to be the amount of revenue, the amount that a firm earns from the sale of a product. Let's take a moment to just love on the fact that a lot of students make this mistake. Revenue is not the same as profit. Profit in a more detailed study will be looked at later and we'll be doing a lot of calculation of profit. Total revenue is just the price of a good times the number of that good being sold, the output sold or the quantity. So the price of the good times the output or quantity sold. To calculate total revenue, the total revenue is always going to be the price times the output. So at that first level over here, we have the total revenue is zero. And in the second, um, the second row down, the first quantity output, the total revenue would be quantity times price, which would be 20. On to marginal revenue. Marginal revenue, like marginal cost, is the additional revenue that a firm produces when an, an additional level of output is produced. Now there's 
so marginal revenue, if we skip the, the middle two stars, marginal revenue is just the total revenue of the certain level of output minus the total revenue of the previous level of output. What you're gonna start seeing, but and this is why I'm going to give you two sets of data to, to calculate and then to graph, if firms are price takers, that means they are not allowed to set the price and the price is predetermined by the marketplace. Price takers only occur in perfectly competitive markets. If a firm is a price taker, their marginal, marginal revenue is always going to be equal to the price. If firms have some level of power in the marketplace, and <laughs> some can be as simple as monopolistic competition, then they are price makers. The marginal revenue will always be less than the price uh, and will always decrease over time. And again, we'll get into more of that as we graph and we'll see more as we get into our specific market structures. To calculate this, marginal revenue is the additional revenue gained from the additional um, from the increased quantity output of a good. So if we're going from zero output to one output, and our revenue is going from zero to 20, we calculate marginal revenue by the re total revenue of our current output minus the total revenue of the previous output, 20 minus zero, which will give us marginal revenue of 20. Average revenue is always going to be price. But why? Average revenue would be the total revenue divided by the total number of goods being produced, or the total amount of output. Since our total revenue is found by price times quantity divided by the quantity output, that means the average revenue is always going to be price. And we don't really need a slide to show you how to calculate that, but you're just dragging this, this price item the whole way over to average revenue. Now something interesting to note is in this particular example, we wrote the price as 20 for total revenue, marginal revenue, and average revenue. That is not always going to be the case. So please, please note that just in this example that I've given you that that occurs, but that will not always occur. So we do need to talk about profits a little bit, and we will get into calculating profits when we get into the specific market structures. But since all firms seek to maximize profit, the profit maximization level will occur where the marginal costs and marginal revenue curves intersect. And there are two types of profits, normal profits or economic profits, where the firm achieves just enough revenue to cover both the implicit and explicit costs of production. Abnormal profits would be when they achieve additional revenue beyond the normal profits, when they're gaining more than just the implicit and explicit costs of production. Explicit costs are the payments that a firm needs to make for all the resources for the production of their output. So this would include the wages for their workers, the materials, their rents, the raw materials, um, different utilities that they need to pay, whether that's uh, fixed or variable costs, all the explicit costs are the resources that the, the firm needs to pay for making that product. product. Implicit costs, however, are the opportunity costs when the entrepreneur considers whether he or she could have been doing something else with, with the time instead of starting and running this business. So the opportunity costs would include the payment to the entrepreneur beyond those explicit costs. The payment for, uh, for starting this business um, as measured by how much they could have been making doing something else. So going back one slide, so even though some firms will not achieve beyond normal or economic profit, please note that because normal or economic profit includes implicit costs, the entrepreneur is still making money. Individuals, the workers in the company are still getting paid. They're not just not making additional profit beyond that. Let's take a moment and say that profit isn't just everything. Not all firms seek to maximize their profit. All firms are certainly interested in profit, but not just maximizing profit. Some firms will produce short of the profit maximizing level simply because they're looking to satisfy certain other behaviors. This is called the satisficing behavior of a corporation or a firm because they're not chasing maximum profits. They're still interested in profits, but they're not looking to maximize. This could be because firms are interested in social responsibility. Most major corporations in the United States and around the world are have some statement or some policy around corporate and social responsibility this might eat into a company's profits a little bit, but for a lot of very good reasons, uh, a firm might want to be interested in giving back to um, the welfare or the health of communities, or might be interested in social or social reforms in their communities and around the world. So even though a firm or corporation might be able to make more profit, corporate social responsibility might keep that company or that firm from reaching a maximizing profit level. Firms might also do this to increase market share. Firms might not chase profit initially to increase market share. Other, other than the satisfying behavior or a social corporate responsibility, some firms are motivated by just increasing market share, increasing the output of their, 
of their firm to outpace some of their competitors. Uh, you might see this in the way Uber and Lyft, ride-sharing companies in the United States, compete. They're not necessarily making a profit at all, but what they're trying to do is increase their market power and their market share so that when they're able to turn a profit, they are outpacing their competitors. A fourth potential interest in firms in the marketplace is just simply business growth. So even though you're achieving uh, or interested in business growth where you might want to be achieving the lowest possible production costs, that might not be the, the highest profit maximizing level, but producing at the lowest possible cost, you're allowing your business to be positioned to grow over time in the long run. So all that being said, that's the end of this lesson, but it's not the end of our story. Again, really trying to stretch the superhero theme here. All firms are des desirous of making money. We're going to practice some examples today, and then we definitely are going to get into specific examples of all of this when we study our different market structures. Thanks, everybody.